everyone. Thank you all for joining. Today, we have the great honor and privilege of having Ms. Lisa Goldman with us. Lisa is a cancer patient and advocate. She was diagnosed with ROS1 positive stage four non-small cell lung cancer in 2014. She co-founded the ROS Wonders um, and currently serves as the vice president and sits on their board of directors. Lisa is also a member of the Pfizer Lung Cancer Steering Committee and a patient advocate for the Lung Cancer Foundation of America. She speaks at medical conferences, both internationally and in the USA, and blogs at every breath I take. Lisa previously worked as a fitness instructor and lawyer. She's joining us today with the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative to share her story. Lisa, thank you so much for your time and willingness to be here with us. Welcome, thanks for having me. Before we continue, we wanna launch a quick poll to get a feel of the audience we have today. We have two questions that ask how much you know about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. So if everyone can take a couple of minutes to fill out the poll, that would be wonderful. Okay, so it looks like we're getting some responses in. So I'll go ahead and end the poll. So it looks like we have individuals who, um, some individuals who don't know much about lung cancer or lung cancer screening, whereas we have some um, other individuals who have heard a little bit about both topics um, and have some prior knowledge. So it's great to see that we have um, a mix of kind of everyone um, in the audience today. And we hope that through our discussion um, with Ms. Goldman, we'll be able to learn more about both topics. So um, to introduce myself and my team, my name is Priyanka Santo, and with me I have Anish Kugilam, and we are part of the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, or ALSI for short. And for those who might not be familiar with our organization, we have a couple of slides to share about who we are. ALSI is a 501c3 nonprofit that works to raise awareness for lung cancer and lung cancer screening. We are a team of over 200 students and doctors located across the United States. We do the work that we do because lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the world, causing more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. And lung cancer causes about 380 deaths per day in the US alone. Lung cancer is very fatal because currently many patients are being diagnosed at a late stage when the cancer has grown and spread to other parts of the body. Lung cancer screening is an effective imaging technique that can be used to screen for lung cancer and is shown to catch lung cancers early. However, less than 6% at high risk for lung cancer are currently getting screened. The screening rate for lung cancer is much lower than the screening rates for breast, cervical, and colon cancers, which are about 70%. We believe educating people about lung cancer, lung cancer screening is one of the most important and effective ways to increase the lung cancer screening rate for populations that would benefit from lung cancer screening. So far, we've given over 120 presentations on lung cancer, lung cancer screening to universities, hospitals, medical schools, and organizations around the US, as well as India, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, reaching over 10,000 people. Over the last year, we worked with 118 mayors from every single US state to issue proclamations recognizing November as National Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And we've also had the opportunity to work with several leaders at the state level, including Arizona State Senator Leela Alston, who's a lung cancer survivor, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, and the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, Diane Primavera. In addition to our education, outreach, and advocacy efforts, we recently started a podcast series to share the personal side of lung cancer and provide a platform for lung cancer survivors and advocates to share their stories. ALSI also worked with U.S. Congress members and senators to draft and advocate for the first ever House and Senate resolutions, recognizing the importance of the early detection of lung cancer through screening. And in December 2020, the Senate resolution was passed with unanimous consent, marking the first time the U.S. Senate has ever recognized the importance of screening. ALSI has also actively been working with Representative um, Representative Brennan Boyle and Senator Tina Smith to draft and advocate for Catherine's Law for Lung Cancer Early Detection and Survival Act of 2021. Lastly, we want to end by talking a little bit about lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening is done using a low-dose computer tomography scan. This scan uses low radiation doses, is pain-free, and takes less than five minutes to complete. 
The United States Preventive Services Task Force, also known as the USPSPF, sets guidelines for who should be screened for lung cancer. And right now they recommend that people between the ages of 50 and 80, who have a 20 pack year smoking history or greater, and who are current or former smokers who, who quit within the past 15 years, get annual low dose CT scans. One pack year is defined as smoking on average one pack a day for one year, and therefore 20 pack years can be met by smoking one pack a day for 20 years or smoking two packs a day for 10 years, for example. And if you know anyone who might be eligible for lung cancer screening based on the criteria listed on the previous slide, please share the link given by the QR code so that they can contact one of our doctors about lung cancer screening. Finally, we want to highlight that there are other risk factors for lung cancer in addition to smoking, such as exposure to asbestos, a family history of lung cancer, COPD, and previous radiation therapy to the lungs. We believe it's important to um, recognize these other additional risk factors because a large number of people in the United States, about 10 to 20 percent, um, who have never smoked um, still get lung cancer. So thank you all for taking the time to listen to that short presentation. Without further ado, we can jump right into the podcast. We have a few questions prepared for Ms. Goldman, but we also have a Q&A session at the end where you can um, submit any questions you have for her. And this podcast is being recorded and will be shared on Spotify, Anchor, Google and Apple Podcasts, as well as our YouTube channel. So first off, Ms. Goldman, could you please introduce yourself and share your background? Sure. Uh, so my name is Lisa Goldman. I am coming to you from California, Northern California. Uh, I've lived here uh, in California most of my life. I was diagnosed in 2014, in January of 2014, with stage four uh, lung cancer, later further uh, spec specified to be ROS1 positive. Uh, adenocarcinoma. And I initially uh, had chemotherapy and now I've been on targeted therapy for many years, targeted to that uh, genetic marker, ROS1. I'm not sure how, how much detail you want me to go into. <laughs> uh, I can go on and on, but I, I'll, I'll let you uh, let me know. Could you just please talk more about your lung cancer journey? Sure. So um, I was, I had just turned 41 at, at the time of my diagnosis. Prior to that, um, I, I had been a fitness, a spin instructor for almost a decade. I was in great cardiovascular condition and, um, and I also taught Pilates and um, strength training and a bunch of bunch of things. So fitness was a big part of my life. I've also been um, plant-based for decades, um, vegetarian for most of my life. So eating healthy was a big thing. I had no risk factors for lung cancer, none whatsoever. So no smoking history, but also no uh, known exposure to radon. We tested um, the home I grew up in and my current home, which I've been in um, for almost 20 years now, neither of them came back um, as testing high for, for radon, um, nor, nor have I lived in any hot spots for radon. Um, I, I grew up in the desert in a place known for good air quality. I haven't worked with asbestos, any, any of those things you've listed. So I just want to clarify, I know um, a, a lot of people assume that all lung cancer patients uh, got their lung cancer from smoking. And as soon as that's debunked, people tend to jump immediately to, well, what else caused it? What else did you do? You know, did you live with someone or work with smokers? Did you, they're looking for a way to blame in a way that I don't often see with other types of cancer. So even though we know smoking causes uh, is, I think even higher as a higher correlation with uh, bladder cancer and, um, and is also involved in causing a number of other cancers, people might ask if you've smoked, but then they don't further than say, well, what else were you exposed to if it wasn't smoking? So sometimes cancer just happens. Um, I started to have, going back to my story, um, in 2013, probably in the summer, I started to not feel so great. I had this pesky cold that I thought, this cough that was bothering me. I went to the doctor um, finally in the fall. I 
no, I didn't get sick very often. So I just thought I'd, you know, wait it out, but it just kept bothering me and I'm all mic'd up for my classes all the time. And so that was becoming a problem that I had to keep pulling the mic away to cough so often. So I, um, I went to the doctor was prescribed antibiotics and cough medicine. And then they told me, well, maybe you have asthma, which I had no history of asthma. Then they said, well, it's allergies, I had no history of allergies. I was treated with a bunch of things. Finally, um, a friend of mine or a friend of my parents, really, who's a retired physician, a gastroenterologist, so knows nothing about lung cancer, but knows enough to see what I'd been going through for months of misdiagnosis and said, and by that time I was coughing quite a lot, um, so much so that I had broken ribs at, at diagnosis um, from coughing and um, and I was starting to get feverish and night sweats and things. And he said, this is, I, I don't know what this is, but this is not allergies or asthma. You need to get to a pulmonologist. So that's what I did. I, uh, I had seen him over the Christmas break when I had vi visited my parents down in the desert in Palm Desert where they live. And um, as soon as I came back um, on January 2nd of 2014, I went to a pulmonologist who immediately, um, you know, it was sort of deceiving. I walked in the office. I looked healthy. I looked pretty healthy. Um, I had taught a spin class just a week or two beforehand before I went away for my holiday break. Um, he was inclined to send me away, but as just a last minute thought he said let me just check your o2 while you walk i'll walk around the office you know like down the hall with the the oximeter on your finger and he saw that my oxygen levels were dropping into the 80s as soon as i just took a short walk um and so he sent me immediately down for a ct um in the same building and as soon as i got that ct uh it was clear something was very wrong i was referred to a, um, for a biopsy, which I had on January 10th, which is the day I was diagnosed. And, um, and it was a complete shock because like I said, I had no risk factors, no reason to believe this was what it was. Um, and, and then here I was with stage four lung cancer. Thank you for sharing that background. I think that really helps to put a perspective on, on, um, what was going through your mind at the time of diagnosis and then um and, and just gives perspective because i think um, we hear this type of story a lot from patients who um, are never smokers that lung cancer was never on their radar it was um not really on their doctor's radar either and that it just took them by complete surprise since i think there's been such a a long um long time association between lung cancer and smoking that um, individuals are surprised to hear that even those who don't smoke are able to get um, lung cancer. And you mentioned um, testing your house for radon. And I just wanted to um, drop a link in the chat that I think some individuals might find helpful. But the EPA has a spreadsheet with radon exposure levels in different zones throughout the US. And so if um, you're interested in seeing what the radon um, levels might be near where you live, you can check this um, spreadsheet out. But Thank you for sharing that, and I'll hand it over to Anish. You touched upon it briefly at the end earlier, but could you please talk about the experience of when you received your lung cancer diagnosis, just some of the things running through your mind um, to some of the emotions? Right. Well, I was completely unprepared. The pulmonologist, when he saw my CT scan, and showed, showed the images to me in the office. As soon as I had them, they sent me right back up to his office to talk to him about it, which should have been a red flag to me, but I had no experience with serious health issues beforehand. So I didn't, didn't, realize, didn't appreciate that. Um, and he had said to me, he never mentioned the words lung cancer. He, he had um, mused that it might be something called sar sarcoidosis, which I'd never heard of, but it didn't sound that bad. He said, you know, well, figure this out and maybe you'll be on some steroids or something. I mean, it didn't sound fun, but it didn't sound like <laughs> terminal cancer. Um, so when I went into the biopsy, I hadn't done any research. I hadn't prepared myself whatsoever. Um, 
oh, or my family, you know, I had two young kids at home and a husband and everything. Um, and I thought I was coming right home, you know, it was supposed to be an outpatient procedure. Um, and when I woke up, it was a Friday evening, uh, about eight o'clock. The surgeon was anxious to, he, uh, you know, he had, his day had gone long. I was, I was supposed to have the procedure a little earlier, but his, you know, it was late Friday night. He wanted to go home. He had kind of the typical bedside manner of a surgeon. He was not the pulmonologist I had met with before. He was um, just not not great with patients. So he just sort of waited for my uh, anesthesia to wear off and informed me the diagnosis, which left me stunned and and then left. It told me that you know an oncologist would be there the next morning, but they were going to take me to the ICU because my lung had partially collapsed in the in the biopsy. So I ended up staying in the hospital for a week. Um, the cancer was so progressed at that time that um, that it it was urgent. I was struggling to breathe. I was on oxygen after that um, biopsy. And they started the chemo uh, right there in the hospital, in the ICU then. So I didn't have the experience of having a chance to kind of research or Google or get second opinions or pick out my doctor, any of that. It was just sort of, you're in the ICU, here's your oncologist. We're gonna do a couple baseline setting scans. So I went in for the bone scan and things like that, brain MRI, whatnot. And, um, and then they started the chemotherapy right then and there. Um, it wasn't, I mean, not that it's ever a good experience to get that news, but it, it was not like a gently delivered, helpful uh, diagnosis experience, I should say. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you were a fitness instructor prior to your diagnosis. Um, so in what ways did your life change after hearing about your diagnosis um, and going straight into chemo? Yeah, um, you know, in some ways, I think um, my extreme cardiovascular health probably masked or compensated for a lot of the, the you know, breathing problems that a, a more average person would have been having. So, you know, the doctor was shocked when he saw the oximeter readings because I was just able to to manage. Um, I obviously, you know, as I mentioned, after coming out of the biopsy, my lung was partially collapsed and I was struggling to breathe and I was on oxygen. I stayed on oxygen 24 hours a day. So I was in the hospital for a week and then I came home with a compression, uh, an air compressor machine so that I could be on oxygen at home. And, and that lasted for almost two months. Uh, so obviously, you know, I can barely walk around my house, let alone teach a spin class. So it was pretty dramatic from teaching just a few weeks before, uh, less than two weeks before I was diagnosed and then uh, being on oxygen. So that was a long way back. Um, you know, eventually I got off oxygen. I started exercising gradually. Um, I've never returned to teaching full time like like I was. That's just um, not I, I can't I can't do what I once was able to do my lungs are too compromised I, I do that said I you know I I exercise regularly I have a spin bike at home I do my own workouts I just am not able to also cue and teach and lead a whole class but I've gotten to a much better um, physical level than I was at diagnosis well, that's great to hear. And I can't imagine how, how much um, a diagnosis like lung cancer would change once. You mentioned that you were diagnosed with um, a Roswell mutation. In your eyes, how critical is genetic testing in advancing lung cancer screening and research? Well, it's the number one piece of advice I give to anybody who tells me that they've been diagnosed with lung cancer. It should be the standard of care that as soon as you're diagnosed that you get uh, biomarker testing, comprehensive biomarker testing. 
Um, unfortunately, for a lot of people, it is not. I happen to live in the Bay Area, which has got um, two major academic uh, teaching hospitals. So, and 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 the and that kind of filters out to a lot of the more sophisticated community hospital docs, um, a lot of whom came from those academic institutions. So it is pretty typical around me now um, for people to get that testing done, but I hear all the time from people in other areas uh, in the United States, let alone outside of the United States, the even bigger problem that people are not getting it um, done as a matter of course, the way they, they should. And it should be done both immediately upon diagnosis and then upon progression and uh, when it's time to determine a new uh, course of therapy. Yeah, huge, huge difference. What advice would you give to someone who's newly diagnosed to ask their PCP? Um, well, hopefully they're not going to just a PCP anymore. <laughs> so if they're newly diagnosed, they should be with an oncologist, not just a primary care physician. Um, and hopefully they can, if they are not able to, uh, to access a thoracic oncology specialist in their area, that they can at least get a second opinion from a thoracic oncologist. Um, I have worked and continue to work with a general oncologist, but also consult a thoracic specialist at the academic institution uh, regularly. There's just too many new treatments, especially with all these biomarkers. Um, the medications have changed a lot in the last few years and the clinical trials are constantly shifting. And so for a patient to be able to access the most promising treatments available to them, they really need to find a doctor who is on top of that. The next uh, piece of advice I give to patients newly diagnosed is to, once you have your biomarker test and you know, you know what you are, so it could be my, you know, ROS1, but there's a number of other choices and including what they call wild type, which is a non-specified, non, at least they don't know it yet what your type is. But even if you're wild type, it's it's best to know what you are and then go find the patient community for that. So as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm a founder, or rather co-founder of the Ross Wonders, a group for Ross One patient, Ross One positive patients and caregivers. There are groups um, for ALK positive patients, groups for EGFR positive, uh, KRAS, what, you name it. And that often is um, one of the very best places for patients to get information because amongst their, you know, this is true, uh, you know, I learned this in college, the more specific you are with your question, uh, the better results you you get in your research, right? So uh, if if I was just to go on to Google and say, what are the best treatments for lung cancer? I'm going to get back a whole bunch of stuff that does not apply to me. Immunotherapy, different types of chemotherapy, who knows what it is, radiation, stuff that I am not, is, is not applicable to my case. If I can narrow it down to not just adenocarcinoma, but ROS1 positive, I'm gonna get the specific targeted therapies that are available, the clinical trials that are out there. I'm gonna find out from other patients what their experiences are with those specific drugs, what kind of um, you know, qualifications you need to get into the trial. So you can be careful about what uh, treatments you choose to preserve your eligibility. I'm gonna find out about specific kinds of side effects for those particular drugs rather than kind of just general information and, and how they're dealing with it. I'm gonna find out um, people's uh, experience with particular doctors and specialists and if they have particular referrals for doctors that have a lot of experience with this particular diagnosis, that sort of thing. So it's, it's really, um, a lot of times people are told, don't go to Google, you know, rely only on your doctor and I, I could not disagree more. You have to Google intelligently, cert, you know, can be a, a smart consumer of information online, but it can be the patient's best friend if you find the right 
resources. I can't imagine how scary it was hearing that you have um, stage four lung cancer, um, but what strategies did you use following your diagnosis um, and through chemo in order to stay positive during those particularly difficult times? Uh, a number of things. Um, at first is I, well, initially it was kind of organic. I didn't set out to write a blog, but as often people do, you know, when they're diagnosed, they start something like a, a caring bridge page, or there's other services like that, just to, or just an email list where they're updating people. So you can cut down on all the calls and text messages and people curious, trying to keep up and support you. So I started doing that just to communicate what was going on. Um, and then that kind of evolved into a blog and the writing was initially, I had intended it as a way to keep other people updated and informed, but it ended up being also a really helpful method for me to process my thoughts and feelings and also connect with others. So then I became um, somewhat known in the lung cancer community. I connected with other bloggers and that was helpful. Um, also the community, the patient communities are a great resource. Finding and seeing other people surviving, coping, doing well with this can be really reassuring. It comes with the flip side. You also are exposed to people who are struggling. Um, so it's, it, it's a little of both, but it, to me, it's worth it. Um, I also did all the things that you'll hear about on online. You know, I, I, I tried the meditation classes. My hospital had a mindfulness class. I, I started building up my tolerance for exercise. That's a huge mental, um, release for me as well as physical. So, um, exercising, um, I became, um, I'm actually a certified Zen Tangle instructor now. So it's a type of meditative art that I find really relaxing. So that's a way for me to um, kind of still my mind and get away from the negative thoughts. Uh, there's lots of things that, you know, it's what, what people find, you know, where do you find your joy? Is it making art? Is it reading? Is it writing? Is it, um, I have a therapist I talk to. Um, I, a proponent of medication when people need it. Plenty of patients um, are on various, uh, you know, anti-anxiety or anti-depression um, types of medications. So there's lots of things. I will say, um, sorry, I'm giving you guys really long answers. Um, it takes a while to find the right therapist. And um, there is a specialty called psycho-oncology, which is a terrible name, makes it sound... <laughs> really scary. Um, but uh, the two academic hospitals here in the Bay Area have psycho-oncology departments with therapists who are specially focused and trained to deal with cancer patients and their particular issues. And I found that incredibly helpful. Um, a general therapist, your regular therapist, whatever, can be helpful as well. But these people who have talked to dozens, hundreds of cancer patients and really understand the issues of someone facing their mortality very um, immediately um, and know how to give you the tools to cope with that or discuss it is, is really, really helpful. And those departments are unfortunately um, somewhat rare and usually quite overbooked. So it can take a while to get in, but I, I do suggest that people ask their doctors uh, if there is a psycho-oncology department in their hospitals. Um, I, I hope that that uh, field continues to grow and becomes more available. Thank you for sharing that. We haven't, um, we haven't really heard about that before, so that's very helpful. No, oh, good. And really yeah, they have it at both Stanford and UCSF. I, I imagine they have it at most of the other major research institutions. I don't know. Um, I don't know about beyond that at community hospitals and things. Okay. So we really admire the advocacy work that you're doing um, for the lung cancer community. And I'm sure many patients are really benefiting from hearing stories of lung cancer survivors like yourself. 
And so on that topic, um, we just wanted to know what motivates you to share your lung cancer story so publicly because um, it definitely takes a lot of vulnerability to share such a private part of your life. Yeah. Well, I'm lucky. I know, um, you know, some people want to be private just because they're private people, but a lot of people feel um, they must be private because they are trying to maintain a professional career at the same time and having it publicly known that they're dealing with a very serious illness could interfere with that in some way. Um, so I had the luxury of not having that concern. I, I was teaching fitness classes. Clearly, I could not continue that while I was um, at the peak of my illness. Um, but it wasn't the major income generator for our family in, in any case. <laughs> so um, so I, I did not have the pressure to, uh, to stay under the radar in that way. And then, you know, I guess it's just my nature. Um, honesty is a big thing for me. Um, and then the shock of finding out, you know, all my life I had been cautioned uh, to be, be on the lookout for breast cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer awareness constantly. Um, nobody mentioned lung cancer to me, not once. Um, and to come to find out that it kills twice as many non-smoking women as breast cancer was just mind blowing. Um, that it, it wasn't even on the rate, like it's not even mentioned and it kills twice as many non-smoking women. What the heck? Why is nobody talking about this? We need to raise awareness. So I really felt the obligation, um, to, to break this cone of silence or ignorance that was going on and, and the stigma that it's always smokers. Um, doesn't matter if you smoked or not, you're, everybody is at risk. So, and, and of course, when you're facing your mortality and uh, you think what's the uh, purpose of my life, I, I at least feel a, a strong motivation to contribute something uh, worthwhile to to the world. So I'm hoping that my sharing has had a positive impact in other people's experiences and, and helped other people um, cope and live longer by finding the right doctors, medications, clinical trials, etc. You mentioned that lung cancer wasn't necessarily ever on your radar. But was, had you ever heard about lung cancer screening before your diagnosis? And did you have any misconceptions or concerns about it? I'd never heard of such a thing as lung cancer screening. As a, a healthy, never smoker woman, no one mentioned such a thing. You touched on this topic briefly um, about misconceptions, but what other challenges or barriers do you think the lung cancer community faces? Um, I mean, the stigma is, is constant. Um, it's still, I, and I try to fight it wherever I can. Um, it's a little bit of a tricky tightrope to walk because when I say I'm a never smoker, there is a, a some people hear and uh, you know the subtext of that as and so I didn't deserve it, but smokers did, and that's not what I mean at all. I'm just trying to change people's perceptions of what a lung cancer patient might look like. Um, that's uh, it's not to cast aspersions on those with a smoking history. Um, and it's just, it's actually really painful to see. Uh, I lost my, my grandmother. I'm named after my grandmother who passed away long before I was born of breast cancer. I lost a very close friend to breast cancer about 10 years ago. It's not that I do not care about supporting breast cancer, but it's very painful to see the constant resources and attention focused on pink ribbons, pink everything, to the exclusion of, of lung cancer when lung cancer is actually harming exponentially or killing exponentially more people. And it's 
and it's invisible to most folks. So I try to push back when I see that happening. So for example, um, my synagogue was doing a fundraiser next month um, and they chose a breast cancer charity awareness, something or other. And I said, that's great. Have you ever done anything for lung cancer? And so now they've invited me to uh, speak on that. Um, and I've done that a number of times. Um, it's also heartbreaking. I try to push back. Uh, it's heartbreaking to see even at like the infusion centers. Um, there's lots of resources, lovely things offered to breast cancer patients. So they'll bring in somebody to help with wigs or makeup or massages or house cleaning services or driving services. And a lot of times those are um, exclusive to women's cancers, they'll call it. So they'll, they'll include ovarian cancer maybe or um, cervical cancer, but, um, but what about everybody else? So uh, this is just a constant um, issue. It, it's sort of, we're not the, the popular kid on the playground and how can we overcome that and change people's perceptions? I think that's a really important point. And just to kind of expand on what you said, um, you, you mentioned that a lot of people are aware of, um, there's a lot of awareness around breast cancer. And um, I think we've done a great job in terms as a community raising awareness about breast cancer. Everyone kind of knows that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Lots of lots of um, campaigns, runs, uh, events, community events um, to show support for breast cancer um, patients. But we don't really see that same um, focus for lung cancer when it comes to November um, Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And um, you mentioned the pink ribbons. Everyone knows that that's a, a universal symbol of um, breast cancer, but uh, lung cancer also has a ribbon and it's white and not many people know that there even exists um, a ribbon for a lung cancer. So I think just awareness events, um, community events is uh, something that we're hoping to to plan in the local Houston communities, a lung cancer run or a lung cancer jog um, come November. And uh, we haven't seen many, many of those types of events around. And so just um, getting the community together, showing support um, for, for lung cancer patients and caregivers, anyone affected by lung cancer, I think is, is very important in one, one educating about the risk factors and symptoms of lung cancer and screening, as well as um, the stigma that we talked about. Just um, removing that stigma. Um, so for someone who has a loved one who was recently diagnosed with lung cancer, do you have any advice for how they can best support and help them? Um, how the caregiver can support the patients? Um, I, I would say it, it depends on the person. So, um, I will start with saying, reaching out to the person and saying, what can I do to help? Or let me know if I can help is not helpful. <laughs> so if you are going to try to help, you need to do the research, the legwork to figure out what would be helpful and take some initiative and not put the burden on the patient to figure that out because they're really overwhelmed and they'll just say, you know, thanks and I'll let you know and they probably won't get back to you. It's, you know, it's hard to think of all those things. And it's also, um, it's awkward to then call somebody back a week later and say, you know what, I thought of something, can you go do my laundry or whatever it was. Um, so I would say, think of something specific and then think of what you have to offer. So, you know, a lot of people love to bring food when somebody's sick. If you don't cook well, don't bring your bad, badly cooked food to a chemo patient that's already nauseous. <laughs> so you don't need to do that. Find what you're good at. If you are good at organizing stuff, uh, patients are inundated with papers and insurance stuff and just having somebody to say, let me take this messy stack that you brought home from the hospital and try to put it in some sort of order for you. That's a huge relief. If you are someone who has kids the same age, say, as the patient's kids, say, you know, let me take your kids out. Let, I'll take them all out to the park or wherever. Um, if you 
happen to, you know, do massage or some sort of healing work, offer that, you know, it depends on what that, that person has to offer. I wouldn't prescribe the same thing from each person. I had one uh, friend who is a, was a medical researcher and she said, just let me know if there's any questions you want research, like, cause people start flooding you with emails of like, Hey, I read about this medication or this crazy trial or whatever. And it's hard to um, sort through that and determine what's what's helpful, what's not. So a lot of those questions, we would just forward to this friend of a friend and that's how she helped me. And that was a huge help. And I would never have known to ask her that. So I would say, look at what your skill set is. Not everybody needs to bring over a casserole. <laughs> cancer and lung cancer especially is life-changing to say the least. So what words of wisdom do you have for people post cancer as far as being able to return to their life as much as they can before the diagnosis? Um, you know, that's so individual and it's, and it's how people recover. Some people, oops, I, sorry about that. Hopefully that'll stop in a second. Um, sorry, it's going to ring one more time, I think. Hello, Aljo, CA. All right, now my answering machine. Hello, Aljo, CA. So some patients are immediately put on a targeted therapy and they go from being really ill and coughing all the time to within a week feeling much better and it are able to resume pretty much their normal life, at least for a while, for as long as that medication keeps them stable, which could be months or years. Um, some people like, like me went to chemotherapy first, which was wildly disruptive, right? It made me super, super sick. Um, and there were periods of time where I, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I wouldn't have been able, if I had a regular um, like office job, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So returning to my uh, pre, pre lung cancer life was not going to happen. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer that, that generally. Um, but I would say, you know, from my personal experience, it was a gradual thing as I started uh, as the chemotherapy started working, and then even more so as the targeted therapy started working, I started exercising a little more. I started being able to reach out to people. I mean, it was a, it was a, this sounds ridiculous, but it was a pivotal moment when I, for the first time, went um, shopping, clothes shopping. So, which was like eight months after I was diagnosed. I, or even longer, it was closer to a year. I, you know, before that, I thought, you know, I was just living moment to moment trying to survive this. Thought, why would I ever spend money on clothes again? And then to wander into a store and, and buy a shirt was such a profound experience at the time to, you know, invest in myself and then also just feel like a normal person in a store. I always felt like I was carrying this secret, like I'm in a store and you think I'm normal, but I know that this is the first time I've been outside my house for almost a year and this is like a huge deal. So I just, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. It's step-by-step step for each person. Yeah, no, that was great. a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> if you had to sum up your lung cancer journey in one sentence, what would that be? And it can be a sentence or a word or a phrase, um, whatever you, you think would be best to sum up your experience. Uh, well, the first thing that came to mind was life changing. And not all for the, the, the worse. I, I, I'm not going to wax poetic about how it, it's a gift, but I have grown and, and learned and changed. Um, and, and not, not, not all of it for the worse. <laughs> 
Thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for taking time out of your day to share your story with us. Now I would like to open the floor for our participants to ask you any questions they may have regarding you or your story and if you feel comfortable answering them. So if you guys would like to ask Lisa a question, please feel free to put it in the chat or unmute. So I have a question um, from an audience member. They ask, do you have any advice for someone who wants to get involved in the lung cancer community? How, how best can we help? So um, there are two big organizations. There are many organizations for lung cancer, but the two biggest uh, general lung cancer support organizations are, at least in the US, are one called Longevity and the other one's called Go To Foundation for Lung Cancer. And they have um, lots of opportunities to contribute depending on your skill set and what you're interested in doing. Um, if you have a particular person you're supporting, like for example, we have our group of Ross Wonders, and sometimes we have caregivers step up because we were a non a small patient run group, nonprofit. We have a minimal budget. And when we wanted to, for example, redo our website we put out a, co a, a post to the internal, to the private Facebook group. Does anybody have expertise in, in developing websites and people will step up and stuff. So if you wanted to help a specific patient group, I would reach out to the organizers of that group and say, is there anything you're needing? Here's the things that I can do. And we, we just had somebody reach out to the Ross Wonders and say, you know, I'm a student, I can't do much, but for my mom, I crocheted these port covers so she could wear her seatbelt in the car. Can I offer that to other people? So it doesn't have to be web design. I mean, it could be as little as, little as something like that if you want to um, help fellow patients. So there's lots of places to plug in, I think. How can we best educate the upcoming generation about lung cancer screening? I, this is a tricky one for me um, because right now the lung cancer screening is only applicable to people with a significant smoking history. And I didn't have that. And I none actually none of the patients that I work with regularly have that. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience with people who have um, received lung cancer screening um, or had their doctors refer them for it. I'm not sure how that process um, works. I wish it was uh, more well known, not just by patients, but by, by doctors. So for example, you know, I was, um, you know, my PCP uh, also just looked at me as a fit younger patient, um, you know, 40 years old, not super young, but young for lung cancer and didn't even think to send me for screening. So um, I think there needs to be education, not just of of patients, but of the doctors. Definitely, I completely agree. Uh, patients really do trust their primary, their doctors in general. And if we're able to educate doctors and healthcare providers in general about the lung cancer screening guidelines and risk factors, I think that that can really help to increase the lung cancer screening rate and identifying those at high risk. And at least maybe just not even getting them screened, but at least just starting a conversation about um, the possibility of, of getting a lung cancer screening test. I'd also, you know, emphasize at this point, I've had countless CTs. So I know what a CT is, but for someone who hasn't had one, a, a CAT scan sounds kind of ominous and scary, but having been through, uh, you know, mammograms and colonoscopies at this point and, and lung CTs, lung CT is by far the easiest least risky, least painful, you know, there's no pain. You, you go in the machine for literally a, a minute or less and come right out. Nothing's attached to you, you know, for a low dose one, they they don't even put in the contrast. There's minimal radiation exposure. The scan itself takes seconds. Like it's painless, quick, easy. I don't think that is um, conveyed just by the term 
a lung CT, that sounds like a kind of a big scary thing. Right. Yeah. And that's oftentimes a topic that we touch upon um, in our podcast, but we didn't get to. So if you feel comfortable sharing, could you just talk about what that experience is like um, actually being in this in the scanner um, and, and and how you re- oftentimes receive the results? And I know it'll probably differ from from institution to institution, but just what that experience was like for you. All right. So I know I don't receive low dose anymore because once you're diagnosed, they give you the the regular full dose uh, because it's a little bit more um, granular and in, in the images it produces. Um, and I often receive um, contrast, which they have to put an IV in and inject some contrast, uh, which also isn't involved in the low dose screen, I believe. So for a low dose screen, a CT machine looks like a giant donut. It's um, it's different from an MRI machine where you go into this tube that causes some people to be claustrophobic. There's no claustrophobia um, involved in a CT. Your head and your feet are kind of outside it's just like the middle of your body that's through the hole of the donut. Uh, so you're lying on a bed, this donut thing is around you and it spins, you can hear it kind of whirring around as it's, as it's scanning. So you lie down, they slide, slide you, slide that like bed thing into the middle of this donut and that thing whirs around. You have to hold your breath for a few seconds so that your lungs stay still. And and that's how they get the images. Um, so it's super easy. There's not even a claustrophobic element. There's no noise like an MRI machine or anything. Um, and, and the results now, so the images go to a radiologist in a basement somewhere, wherever they are, I never meet them. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the text that that do the actual images are, I don't know, they're trained by actors or something because they always keep a straight face. They never betray anything that's going on, although clearly they can interpret the images to some extent. But um, so you don't find anything out in the moment, um, but the radiologists tend to turn around the reports pretty quickly. Um, and maybe that's a function of the serious diagnosis. I might get um, more priority than um, somebody walking in with, I don't know, you know, a broken bone or something. I, I don't know if, you know, stage four cancer patients kind of go to the top of the pile or, or radiologists are just quick. But you, usually the radiologist report is posted within 24 hours and often it's like within three or four hours. Um, and it used to be that uh, the radio, so I could always see the timestamp, but I might not hear the results until my doctor vetted it, reviewed it, and released it to me. Um, but now there was a law passed, at least in California, I, I'm not sure if it's nationwide, I think it might be, that um, the doctors, the oncologists, or any doctor can no longer be kind of the gatekeeper of those reports. Once the radiologists approve the reports, they immediately go um, released into your account. It's your medical information. So I get an alert you know, on my text or my email that says a new test result has been posted in your uh, online account, and I can go and read the report. Um, some patients don't like that. That stresses them out. I personally love it because um, the waiting is the worst part for me, just wondering, stressing the anxiety. And I also like to be prepared. So even if there's something bad in the report, I or maybe even especially if there's something bad in the report, I want a moment to digest it um, think of the questions I want to ask, maybe talk to some other patients who have dealt with the same thing so that when I talk with the doctor, I can be efficient with my time with them to elicit the information I need. If the doctor springs that information on me in the moment, I am not able to both absorb it, process it, and then ask all the questions that I want to ask in that precious time with the doctor. So, uh, that's how it works for me. I get those results quite quickly. Before before that law was passed, I was the pain in the butt patient who was constantly calling my doctor's office saying, have you gotten the report yet? Could you please release that? Please let me know. So uh, that that's me. I like more, more information is better. 
Yeah, we hear about ski anxiety a lot from from patients, and I can imagine it's probably very nerve wracking, not knowing, not knowing um, what the yeah. Right is. yeah. So, um, in the next few months, what are you looking for forward to most? Um, well, I hopefully, if COVID allows, knock on wood, I hope to take a big trip. I'm turning 50 in October, and so I'm hoping to take a, a big trip. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to that. I'm also, uh, I've been focusing on my art a lot and enjoying that. So focusing on um, planning some big painting projects and things. So yeah, thought and, and taking care of my kids, you know, daily life has a new uh, preciousness to it. So a lot going on with my kids right now. Great, thank you. Well, we're wishing you well and we're wishing you the best. Um, this um, wraps up our Q&A session, but thank you so much again, Lisa, for your willingness to share your story and perspective on many of the pressing issues in the lung cancer community. We appreciate the work that you're um, currently doing to raise awareness about lung cancer. And thank you, everyone, for joining our podcast. Uh, please keep an eye out for our upcoming podcasts and events, which will be listed on our website, www.lc.org. We also encourage you to join our monthly newsletter, which will be in the comments section, um, where we will share updates on upcoming projects with our organization. Uh, feel free to fill out the Google form if you'd like to be added to our mailing list. And before we end this, we also would like to offer a brochure highlighting some key information about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. If you find this helpful or know of anyone who might benefit from the information included, uh, feel free to share it. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Lisa.